Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, hello, uh, and welcome to today's National Blood Clot Alliance Mini PEP. This event is a joint collaboration between Mended Hearts and the National Blood Clot Alliance. Uh, it is supported by an educational grant from BMS Pfizer. And today's topic is how heart disease and reduced cardiac function increase a person's risk for venous thromboembolism. And we will also address how VTE can lead to right heart strain. Uh, but before we get started, I would like to introduce our guests. First, we have Todd Robertson. Uh, Todd is the Director of Patient Engagement at the National Blood Clot Alliance. Many of you already know him. He is an NBCA board member. He is co-host of our PEP series. Uh, and Todd is a blood clot survivor himself. Todd, welcome to today's okay. event. Uh, and we are also joined by uh, Dr. Alejandro Bernal. Uh, Dr. Bernal is originally from Colombia. Uh, where she graduated from the University of Andes. She then completed her internal medicine residency at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, following the Cleveland Clinic, she completed her cardiology and critical care fellowship at the University of Minnesota. Post fellowship, she joined the faculty at the University of Minnesota and now works in the cardiac ICU treating post-arrest patients. Her clinical interest is in critical care medicine and post-ICU follow-up. Uh, she is also a member of the National Blood Clot Alliance uh, Council of Emerging Researches in Thrombosis. Uh, Dr. Bernal, we thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and with that, uh, Todd, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, Dr. Bernal, thank you so much for being here. Like I said earlier, we uh, uh, this is a very important topic, and we have a lot of patients that are concerned about it, and they know to go straight to their doctor and talk about it, but it's good to get some of this insight, too. So, so glad you're here to, to give us some of that insight. But I, I do have a couple of questions. You know, today's event is really for two patient populations, right? First, those that have had heart disease um, or reduced cardiac function and how and why this may increase a person's risk of VTE. Yeah. Second, how venous thromboembolism and really pulmonary embolism can lead to right heart strain. So let's first start with some information about venous thromboembolism. What is it? What are the signs and symptoms so people are aware of it first and foremost? And then why is it that a person with heart disease may have an increased risk of VTE? Is there a way to protect oneself from getting a venous blood clot? And if you do have heart disease, how can you protect yourself? How would someone be treated as well? Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I'm really honored to be here. So um, you asked a, a big question. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, so I'll take it one by one. Okay. Um, to start with, um, deep venous thrombosis or a DVT occurs when there's a blood clot that forms um, deep inside your body due to slow flow in one of your veins or after a vein is injured or hurt. These clots can cause trouble because they can sometimes partially or actually uh, completely uh, block blood flow in one of the veins the job of the veins is to bring all the blood back up to your, um, from the periphery up to the heart. So DVTs most commonly occur in the lower leg, um, although sometimes they happen in the thigh or the pelvis or any other parts of the body. A person with heart disease um, is at increased risk of developing a blood clot due to many different factors, but uh, when the heart is weak, there is more slow blood flow around the body. The heart um, has a harder time pumping that blood around because the pressures in the heart are high and the muscle is just weaker. Um, so when you have slow flow, you increase the risk of blood, cl blood clots forming. It's also harder for a patient with a low pumping function to exercise. And so they tend to have a lower levels of physical activity than other counterparts. Um, and this also leads to a higher tendency to clot. So uh, the problem is big in the U.S., you know, in the general population, about one to three people out of a thousand people will develop a clot, um, either in the legs or in the lungs, as we'll talk in a little bit. And so um, the, the DVT or PE is what we call it when the clot is in the lungs, can affect anybody of any age, but it's more common in people who are older. And like I said, in the case for this talk, in patients who have low pumping function. Um, more than half of all those DVTs occur in patients who've been um, in the hospital for medical conditions or a surgery. And this happens because during a hospital stay, um, people tend to stay more time lying in bed and being immobile. Um, patients who are in the hospital and have also a low pumping function who are not given blood thinners, um, we know from studies that have a higher tendency to develop these blood clots. So it's important to know that you're at risk. 
Um, how may you know whether you have a clot in your leg? So those would be the symptoms. So um, one of the things you may encounter is swelling in the leg or um, the arm. And now we know that patients with low pumping function have swelling in the legs sometimes due to low pumping function. So it may be harder to differentiate. But if you see that one side is bigger than the other one, that may be a clue or that it suddenly happened um, all of a sudden and that it's associated with pain or increased tenderness in that area. Um, or if the, the leg feels kind of warmer than usual um, or it's discolored or red. Um, and sometimes you can see kind of like engorged or big veins um, and that may be a clue. Um, symptoms of a more severe related condition called a PE that happens when that blood clot migrates up to the lungs can include other things like chest pain, shortness of breath. Sometimes people cough up blood, have lightheadedness or fainting. Um, and so if you experience any of these symptoms, obviously it's crucial to contact your doctor immediately and go to an ED. Um, the most important thing is to get prompt treatment to prevent um, a serious complication. Um, and then um, the last part of it was treatment options, right? Like, what do we yeah. do if we find that you do have one of those clots? Well, the mainstay of treatment is really a blood thinner. Um, and then sometimes your doctor may ask you to wear compression stockings or elevate the, that area to reduce some of the swelling. Um, in some cases, especially when the clot is very big, we may do some other invasive treatments and catheter-based treatments. Um, but the primary goal, what we're trying to do is really to prevent that clot from getting bigger and traveling or affecting other veins. Um, and finally, um, I think you asked me, Todd, about prevention. Um, so uh, the last part would be prevention. So now that you know you're at increased risk, what can you do to prevent that from happening? So the most important thing is exercising. So exercise your calf muscles. So if you can't move around, just moving around your legs up and down to get that blood moving um, is important. If you can stand up, walk at least every half hour, if you're um, in being in bed for a long period of time, or um, if you're in a car drive or something, get out of the car every hour, um, get out of bed and move around if you're sick um, as soon as you can, um, because the sooner you move around, the lower your risk. Take medications or use compression stockings as uh, directed by your provider. Um, and then, as always, follow up with your provider and, and the recommendations that they've given you. Dr. Bernal, th that was a lot to unpack. You're right, but you hit <laughs> everything uh, perfectly. So thank you so much. Leslie? So um, before we move on, I'm just curious, for somebody who does have uh, limited cardiac abilities, exercising can be difficult. Correct. So can we just retouch upon your recommendations in terms of what they could or should be doing in terms of moving their legs, pumping their legs, et cetera, for, for this audience? Yes, absolutely. I think that's very important. And um, I think that's part of the risk of the, the thing that confers such a high risk. So the most important thing is um, you don't have to go out and, and like run or or do exercise or go on a treadmill. The important thing is do whatever you can do. Anything you do will decrease the risk. So if you can't get out of bed, even just doing up and down with your, your with your foot would help. Um, even with patients when they're very um, immobile, even passive motion, when somebody actually helps you move the leg would, would help. Um, but just do as much as you can. If all um, you're comfortable doing is um, walking a little bit or slowly, any activity actually decreases the risk. So um, don't don't stop because you feel that what you can do is not enough. Anything is better than not doing it. So that do, makes do, they, do they have to be very mindful of their heart rate? Like they need to talk to their cardiologist, right? And ask what that threshold is, because a lot of people experience a faster heart rate after a pulmonary embolism, and they're afraid to do too much because they don't want it to spike mm -hmm. too high. So is there any guidance you can give with that? Yes, Todd. Very, very good question. We we're actually talking about this recently. So um, there is a great guidance. Normally, we um, uh, don't want patients to have a very high heart rate. And like you said, the, the most common symptom, the most common thing we see with a P is tachycardia, which means just a fast heart rate. Um, but just because we see a fast heart rate doesn't mean we want you to stay in bed. So I think um, many people may not be able to monitor their heart uh, rate or have a um, you know a watch or something like that. But I think as long as you do enough um, to not cause significant increase in your shortness of breath, if you had a PE, I, I think we're talking about that right now, yep. 
that would be um, acceptable and good. So if you start just walking around at home um, when you're discharged, that that's that's good. What we don't want is for you to think that you can't do anything and uh, you may make the problem bigger if you just stay in bed because if you'll be deconditioned and then we said uh, not moving around increases the risk of, of the blood clot getting bigger and so forth. And so um, any activity you do is kudos. It's great. Great <laughs> advice. Thank you. The question. <laughs> that is, it's great advice. And also for caregivers, they should also, also be aware of this. You know, they could help potentially uh, the patients and just to be able to identify the signs and symptoms uh, as well. So super advice. Um, okay. So let's talk about right heart strain. A little bit of a different topic here. So um, it sounds like a, a relatively significant amount of pulmonary embolism patients actually get right heart strain, correct? That is correct, yes. And so um, the, thankfully, the majority of patients who have a pulmonary embolism have what we call a low-risk PE, which uh -huh. doesn't cause problems. But yes, a, major, a, a significant proportion of them do. Okay. So explain to us exactly what right heart strain is. Um, why a pulmonary embolism, which is the blood clot that goes into the lungs, can cause it, um, and what the symptoms of a right heart strain um, are with a pulmonary embolism? Yes. So um, we'll step it back and kind of um, explain the whole thing. When, when you have a pulmonary embolism, this actually means that the blood clot has traveled into your lungs, so it had come up the veins, pumped by the right side of your heart, and gone into um, the lungs, and is blocking one of the blood vessels there. Um, so uh, it makes it harder for the heart to just pump blood through the lungs because the blood clot is acting like a roadblock to the, to the stream of blood. Um, so your heart has mainly two sides, the left side and the right side. The right side of the heart will pump blood to the lungs. So it picks up oxygen, gets rid of carbon dioxide, and then it goes to the left side where it pumps to the rest of the body. But when there's a clot in the way, it has to work so much harder to, just to do this job. If you imagine your heart just as a pump and the clot as something that's clogging that pipe, the pump has to push so much harder to get the blood through that clogged pipe. And this extra effort literally strains the heart, um, the right side of the heart. So the strain on the right heart of the uh, heart is what we call right heart strain. And you may hear it in the hospital. And it happens because that, that heart is working extra hard to overcome that blockage. Um, it can cause symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath, you can feel lightheaded and some people even faint. Um, and it is essential, really, the most important thing is to get medical attention if you're experiencing any of these symptoms because untreated right heart strain can be very serious. And doctors can really help manage it and ensure that heart is functioning as well as possible while your body is recovering from a PE. Does okay. Make sense? Yes, yes, it does. So um, talk to us about how you actually diagnose it you know, when the patient comes into the hospital, how do you diagnose it? How do you treat it? It sounds like some people need treatment longer term versus shorter term for others. Um, and is right heart strain curable? Very good question. So let's talk about how you diagnose it. So when you come into a hospital and they actually find out that or think that you may have a clot in your lungs, the most important thing they'll do and what we do um, always is to talk to you and ask you about your history and symptoms. So your doctor will begin asking questions about uh, if you've been experiencing chest pain, shortness of breath, having lightheadedness, if you've actually fainted, that may clue us in into whether um, there is strain or not. Then they'll do a physical examination. And by that, we'll look at the um, heart rate that we were discussing. Um, we may listen, we're, we're going to listen to your heart, but we may... Uh, hear different heart sounds that may clue us into different things. We'll see how you're breathing, your oxygen, um, and kind of see how much strain your, your heart is at and, and if you're struggling breathing wise as well. Um, we'll do imaging tests. So normally to confirm the diagnosis, we may order tests. Um, sometimes we'll do a chest x-ray. We'll likely do a CTPE, which is just a computer tomography with the contrast that allows us to see that block clot. And the uh, images of all the chest and you can see the heart there. So you can compare the right side to the left side and you can diagnose right heart strain by that. Um, and sometimes, many times, if we are suspecting this, we will also do an ultrasound of the heart or an echocardiogram. We'll put jelly on your chest and look at the heart and measure your heart and look at the actual function of the right heart 
um, to really define whether it's struggling or not. Um, we'll likely also do an electrocardiogram or an ECG where we put little patches on your chest to look at the electrical activity of the heart. Because when the heart, uh, when the right side of the heart is struggling, we can see irregularities in that conduction of the heart. And finally, you know, the blood tests. So we look at certain blood tests like the troponin or for some people who have low pumping function, they may be aware of the nt BMP, which are measurements of, of um, strain and um, of the heart and, and heart muscle damage in some point that clue us in and also help us define whether there is right heart strain. Now, once we realize or we uh, define that you have right heart strain, how do we treat it? The main treatment for right heart strain is really to treat the cause, which is that clot. Um, and we just provide support for the heart while the clot is being dealt with. So um, just as in clots in the legs, the main um, the mainstay of treatment for a clot in the lungs is blood thinners. So um, we'll start you on a blood thinner right away. Um, and this may prevent the new clot from getting bigger um, and allow the body to deal with the clot that's already there. Sometimes um, your doctors may feel that the clot is so big or your heart is struggling so much that they may suggest other invasive strategies or procedures that may uh, remove or dissolve that clot. Um, now, long-term, the, the duration of the anticoagulation or the blood thinner that you'll be on will depend on many different things that you'll discuss with your doctor, such as your other medical history or risk factors. Um, but you should be followed up to find out and define how long should you be in blood thinners and whether you should keep taking blood thinners um, for a prolonged period of time. Um, okay. So it's curable, but you need to make sure you're on the right protocol. Um, yes, yeah, I missed that part. Yes, right, hind, uh, right heart strain itself is a condition that can often improve if we okay. have the appropriate treatment. So uh, if we are able to treat the underlying cause, which is that clot, Mm -hmm. We should be able to um, effectively treat the the strain on the right heart of this uh, of the heart, and this typically lessens. Um, but um, this is why it's important to follow up and make sure that that things are going in the right direction. Symptoms are improving. Sometimes doctors may want to repeat the ultrasound of the heart to see whether that right side of the heart has improved or not, and that may guide farther studies, treatments, or management. At that point, they may decide that. If things aren't looking better, that you may want to be seen by a heart doctor just to ensure that um, nothing else needs to be done. Okay, uh, it's a it's a lot to unpack uh, for a patient, but this is really important. And then, you know, we often get asked the question, what is the difference between right heart strain, now that we kind of have a better understanding of uh, what the right side of the heart does, yes. and right heart failure? Yes, no, that's a, that's a great question and kind of a uh, sometimes a uh, murky place to distinguish them. But um, right heart strain occurs, it tends to be um, more of a, a time-limited uh, condition. It tends to occur when the right side is working harder to try to overcome some um, issue, which is here blockage in the, in the pulmonary arteries. Um, it's a temporary condition. And so with proper treatment, the right side, uh, right heart strain will recover. However, right heart failure talks a little bit more about a chronic condition. It's a clinical syndrome where the right side of the heart is really unable to pump enough blood despite um, lack of basic treatments. And so you're having issues with getting enough blood flow to all of your body. And it really uh, requires chronic treatment, um, specialty treatment, and long-term care. Um, and there's a few things that your doctors may want to do to kind of define why right heart failure happens. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that. I think there's going to be another mini pep maybe on this topic uh, going forward because this is important information for, for patients to have. Okay, Todd, I'm going to turn it back to you. Yeah, one thing I want to ask Dr. Bernal is, you know, it's really important. Let's let's talk about doctors again and let's talk about the <laughs> medical team because when a new patient comes out of the doctor's office or they're sent home after the ER visit, their heads are spinning, right? Yes. They don't even know who to talk to. They don't know what to ask. Um, I know that I was actually uh, told to wear a Holter monitor uh, mm -hmm. for a week, and that showed some PVCs, and so that led to an echocardiogram. It turned out not being related, but I got hooked up with the right doctors, and that's really important for patient care. So we're often asked in our like support groups, asked by the patients who should treat them, and we often tell them that it's a hematologist right off the bat or a pulmonologist. But in the case of right heart strain, 
who treats this? To, what's the name of the doctor? Is it a cardiologist? And should patients make sure they have a cardiologist in this instance as part of their medical team? Yes, that's a, that's a fantastic question. So um, a very important one, because I think it really depends, um, as it, it shouldn't, but it really depends um, on um, what um, what's available in your area too. Um, and so I think... Um, Everybody who treats blood clots knows that, um, especially clots in the lungs, that the heart can be um, involved or that this can cause right heart strain. So I think it's important to ensure that you're communicating with your doctor, and it can be the hematologist or the pulmonologist, all of your symptoms, um, and especially if you've had persistent shortness of breath, if you have sometimes chest pain, if you feel that things, despite the blood thinner, are just not getting better, um, to make sure that they check or or look again to see if this right heart strain has resolved or persisted. There are some centers that have protocols in place to repeat these type of tests, like ultrasounds and things like that. Most of the cases, um, it will resolve because like we said, you took care of the clot. But it is important to not um, overlook this and to ensure that if it doesn't resolve, you do see a cardiologist. If you have persistent right heart strain after a pulmonary embolism or a clot in the lungs after uh, three months of treatment, you should be seeing a, blood, a heart doctor uh, because what we are going to do may be a little bit different and there's other things, we, other testing we need to do, other medications that may be available. Um, and we have, it's a, it's a very complex topic. We have even subspecialties within the heart doctors that deal with this specific type of problem. Sure. So um, if you've never seen a cardiologist, I don't think you should be alarmed that there's something wrong or that there's been any um, right. error. Um, but if you are not feeling back to yourself and you're still struggling with shortness of breath, it may be something to ask your doctor about. That, that, that's a good point because people get worried, you know, they have this emotional impact going yes. on that, that's really severe and they're told to go see a cardiologist. And so they immediately think, oh my goodness, I've got a heart problem. Then. Yeah. But everybody, you know, we've got specialists for a reason. Not one doctor knows everything. We no. have to go see the specialist. So excellent advice. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I think um, just uh, make sure you tell them everything you're feeling. And like, I, I like your idea, Todd, don't, don't think that it's expecting the worst. It's just um, right. many times preventing things right. from going by the wayside. Yeah, thank you. This is amazing. So Dr. Bernal, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know I learned a lot from you today. I'm sure Todd did also. Uh, this is valuable information for the patient and caregiver community. So thank you again for joining us and we hope to have you back. For, for another event. Um, we'd also like to thank BMS Pfizer again for the educational grant and also remind people this event should not be construed as medical advice. Uh, it is for educational purposes only. We want you to consult your own clinicians uh, about your specific personal um, health journey. And to learn more about heart disease, uh, we encourage everyone to go to our partner organization, Mended Hearts at mendedhearts.org. And of course, for information regarding venous blood clots, please go to stoptheplot.org. And for um, folks who are listening, if they'd like to um, uh, see Dr. Bernal's background, you can also go to the uh, university's website and find you there as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Thanks Thank for being you for here. joining us. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.